Hello, everybody um, from Dalwell country. Um, big thank you to Fusion for the opportunity to have this conversation tonight. So I understand that Fusion is made up of four parties. So how many pirates are there here? If you want to whack your party affiliation, if you have one into the chat, I'd love to know exactly who I'm talking to. If you want, no pressure. Um, hi, pirates, hi, science party, um, hi, secular party, and hi, vote planet. Um, Karen didn't tell you much about me, so I will just give an introduction as to why I do what I do, why I go out there in the big bad world and advocate for nuclear energy. So I'm actually the president of an organization called the Australian Nuclear Association, which is actually a volunteer organization, and it's made up of individuals with an interest in nuclear topics, including nuclear energy. But my interest in nuclear science and technology began when I was studying environmental engineering um, back in, in university. I was doing environmental engineering and I needed an honours thesis topic. So I thought, why not, why not nuclear waste disposal? I mean, what about the waste, right? I found nuclear to be a little bit controversial and a little bit mysterious, so I naturally wanted to know more. So my interest in nuclear began when I was studying environmental engineering because I had an interest in, in radioactive waste. So my career took a bit of a detour and then I worked for 14 and a half years at the Opal Research Reactor in Sydney, um, specialising mostly in nuclear safety and licensing and regulation. Um, before I joined the Australian Nuclear Association, though, I was a president of another organisation called Women in Nuclear Australia. And I guess by working at Australia's own nuclear reactor and also being the president of WIN, it allowed me to participate in a number of international conferences that were often primarily focused on nuclear energy. So there's surveys in the world that show that the more people feel they know about nuclear energy, the more they tend to support it. So I went from not knowing much about nuclear energy and being quite agnostic, but curious, um, to knowing a lot and hence being well, very supportive of it. So it's supportive enough that I'm now regularly talking to groups such as yourself, community uh, groups, political groups about nuclear energy. There's definitely more of an interest now and people just want more information. Um, but I just want you all to know, just beware, um, knowledge does tend to increase support. So if you do stay, you might find yourself in a position where your path to conversion has began if it already hasn't, if you are not so keen on nuclear energy anyway. Anyway, I kid around. So to sum it up, why do I advocate for nuclear energy? Because out of all the technologies currently available to generate nuclear, so sorry, to generate energy, I believe with a, with a fairly high degree of confidence that nuclear energy has the lowest overall impact on the environment. Um, is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, but neither is any other energy source. They all have their pros and their cons. Um, enough about me. I think that's enough information. Um, today, I want to cover a few things, uh, but I'm most interested or more interested in hearing from you. So most of today is really about hearing what you think about nuclear, um, any areas of concern you might have, or even things that you like about it as well. I've also got a question for Fusion as well, which I'll put up um, in the Q&A, because um, I'm intrigued by one of Fusion's policies. I will cover three topics today. So first one is what is nuclear energy? Um, don't worry, I won't go too hard on the nuclear uh, physics. So the second thing I'll talk about is the current nuclear situation in Australia, uh, including the nuclear fuel cycle and also how nuclear energy came to be banned in Australia. And lastly, I'll give a summary of nuclear energy around the world and some of the benefits of nuclear energy. So after that, we'll have some Q&A. So I'm doing a bit of a backwards presentation. I have no slides for my presentation, but I do have slides for the Q&A. So first, what is nuclear energy? Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are two different kinds of energy. There's fission, and, so nuclear energy. There's fission and fusion. Fusion is the ultimate political party. No, sorry, fusion is the ultimate energy source. If we can crack it, our days of worrying about energy will be over. What we do have today though is nuclear fission. 
A nuclear fission is essentially all about the nucleus of an atom, so the protons and the neutrons. If you think back to your high school or, or university days, even we learned back then that atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Forget about the electrons. Nobody cares about these except for chemists, okay? In physics world, it's about protons and neutrons. So these things are all held together tightly uh, by a thing called the strong nuclear force. So what nuclear energy does is it gets a neutron to hit these atoms to break, break apart the nucleus of an atom. And when this happens, some of the mass is converted into energy. Think um, E equals mc squared. So typically nuclear fission works by fissioning um, uranium atoms, but you can use other kinds of atoms too. When an atom such as uranium does fission, you get these things called fission products, which are smaller atoms, because you know, you've got one atom, it's now two atoms. These are called fission products. You also get two or three neutrons released. One of those goes off and splits another atom. And you also get a release of energy. So nuclear energy is the most dense form of energy available. So if you had one kilogram of uranium-235, which is a kind of uranium, and you could split every single atom in that one kilogram of uranium, you would get as much energy um, as 1.5 million kilograms of coal. So one kilogram of uranium-235 equals one and a half million kilograms of coal. So just while I finish up this conversation on what nuclear energy actually is, um, the world has two basic types of nuclear reactors. It has power reactors and it has research reactors. So Australia has a research reactor called Opal. It's in Sydney. So Opal is designed so that you maximize the production of neutrons and then use the neutrons that come out of that fission for various different processes. But power reactors are designed so that you use the energy that comes out of those fissions. This energy is used to heat water, which makes steam, which turns turbines, and then electricity comes out the other end and people get to use it. So that's a little bit about what nuclear energy is. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is the, uh, the nuclear situation in Australia. So Australia has been operating research reactors since 1958, and we've had three in total. So they were and are uh, primarily used for nuclear medicine production, for neutron science, and for industrial purposes. Opal makes over half a million patient doses of a particular radioisotope called technetium 99 m every single year. And this is the isotope that's used in about 80% of nuclear medicine procedures worldwide. Um, there has been some talk of using accelerators to make technetium 99M, um, but to date, this method has not been used on a commercial scale. Reactors have been preferred because they provide larger yields, higher activities, and they're more efficient. Um, interestingly, Canada is trying something new they're going to use one of their nuclear power plants to make technetium 99, which I think is super cool. Um, but we do use things like accelerators and cyclotrons to make other nuclear medicine products. So in Australia, we use nuclear reactors for various things, including saving people's lives. Um, Australia also uses radiological techniques across a wide range of applications, including agriculture, uh, sterilization, so we use radiation to sterilize food and medical equipment and insects, things like that. We also use radiation uh, to do environmental studies, so we put radiation into the environment um, to study different natural processes. Obviously, if you've been to an airport, you'll see they have x-ray machines, that is a use of radiation, and the last use is for industry, for a whole variety of different things. So what about uranium? So uranium is the main fuel used in, in nuclear reactors. So Australia has about a third of the known uh, resources of uranium in the world, but we're only the fourth largest producer. So in a typical year, we'll export the same amount of uranium that we could use in Australia to completely power the national energy market. 
but we have no nuclear um, energy in this country. So we don't use any of the uranium for power that we dig up. So how much is this? We export about 5,000 to 8,000 tonnes of uranium per year, which isn't a lot when you think about it. I'll be exported as yellow cake. I'm sure you've seen pictures of yellow uh, barrels with the yellow powder in it. So there's actually laws in Australia that prevent us from value adding and turning that yellow cake into nuclear fuel that we can then sell to the world. Um, at the other end of the fuel cycle, affectionately known as the back end, um, Australia's policy is to reproduce, sorry, not reproduce, <laughs> reprocess used nuclear fuel. We recycle it. So we get our used fuel, we send it overseas, and the country we send, send it to takes out the useful ingredients um, and send us back the waste materials. So in terms of waste disposal, there are many low-level disposal facilities operating around the world, and we're also planning to build one in South Australia. I'm sure you might have heard of that. So the reason why a waste disposal facility for low-level waste is so important is it ensures that the Opal Reactor and the people working at ANSTO um, can continue to make nuclear medicine and have adequate space available um, to continue that production cycle. It's also important, I think, that ANSTO and Opal focus on what they're good at, which is making nuclear, me um, nuclear medicine and doing science um, and putting their focus there um, instead of diverting a lot of resources towards waste management. But I'm happy to talk about uh, waste with people later on. Uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but Australia is the only G20 nation that has a regulatory ban on nuclear energy. Um, out of the G20 nations, 17 currently use nuclear energy and two have programs to establish nuclear energy programs. Um, out of the tweet, G, uh, how long is it? Then there's Australia. So we are a little, in a little way um, the old one out when it comes to the G20. So how exactly did nuclear energy become banned in Australia? I'll try to keep this short, but back in the 1990s, it was identified that the research reactor that was operating at the time, it was called HIFA, was aging. And multiple parties, um, including people like the nuclear medicine community, wanted it replaced. Um, there were some political parties um, that weren't too keen on the idea of building, of, of Australia building another research reactor. So the government at the time wanted to modernise nuclear safety and radiation protection legislation and set up a new regulatory system with a new regulator. So to do this, there was a bit of a compromise. Um, on one side, there was a smooth transition of the new laws through parliament. Um, to allow a new research reactor to be built um, in exchange for regulatory bans on other nuclear activities, um, including nuclear energy. So nuclear energy wasn't banned for technical reasons or safety reasons, um, but via, I think it's called horse trading. I don't know too much about it. Horse trading uh, but with little or no community input. There might've been some, um, but there was no big debate as far as I'm aware. Um, it was a different time in the 1990s, though, because energy prices were low, energy systems were reliable, and climate change was a thing, but it wasn't really a thing, if you know what I mean. Um, so just to finish off, um, the third thing I'll talk about today uh, is nuclear energy in the world and some of the benefits of nuclear. So what is the story with nuclear energy? So interest has definitely picked up since COP26, which was the big climate change event in November last year in Glasgow. So COP26 was the first noticeable big swing in support for nuclear energy um, in possibly decades, at least in Western countries. Um, there's also been renewed interest this year due to the current energy crisis. Countries are really paying attention to the fact that energy security is important and that a lack of energy can have devastating economic and societal impacts. Combine this with the need for sustainable climate change action and nuclear power looks very attractive to many countries, uh, but not all countries. A handful are still trying to phase out nuclear. Um, 
which overall isn't contributing um, to energy security, the price of energy or to climate change goals. Um, let's just go back for a second to the countries that are pursuing more nuclear. I'm just gonna handpick a few of the country's announcements from the last 12 months or so. So France announced their intention to build new um, nuclear power plants for the first time in decades. They want to build about six to 14 reactors by 2050. The UK wants to generate around 25% of their electricity from nuclear, up from around 16% today. Now, this might not sound like a lot, but all but one of their reactors are due to retire by 2030. So this means more new builds. Um, Canada is a world leader in the development and implementation of this particular kind of reactor called a small modular reactor. They have a strategic plan for the rollout of SMRs across four provinces. Um, they also have a fleet of highly reliable reactors called can-do reactors um, that have either had their life extended or are likely, or, sorry, or could have their life extended um, by another 30 years. The US is awakening from its nuclear slumber and is looking closely at possibilities for a coal to nuclear transition, amongst other things. Um, the Democrats in the US, who were against nuclear energy for more than 40 years, are now supportive. Um, who says a political party can't or won't change their minds? Uh, last but not least, China plans to build 150 nuclear reactors in the next 15 years. Um, if anyone can do this, China can. So there's actually other exciting things happening in other countries, but I think that's enough of that for now. Something else that might also interest the uh, Fusion Party and everyone else here today is the EU taxonomy. Who's heard of the EU taxonomy? Couple of, one shake, one hand up. All right. So. If you haven't heard of the European Union taxonomy, it's a list of economic activities that is aimed to provide companies, investors, and policymakers with appropriate definitions for which activities can be considered environmentally sustainable. So it's a bit of a guidance document for which activities sort of hit those sort of environmental sustainable criteria and which ones don't. So did nuclear energy make the list? Yes, it did, but it absolutely had to jump through hoops to get in, whereas other technologies walked in with um, little or no questions asked. Uh, unfortunately, nuclear got lumped in with gas in the same sort of vote, so it didn't make the decision-making process all that easy. So the last thing I'll do today is finish off with a bit of a discussion on the answer to the question, why nuclear? Why, why even consider it in Australia? Why exactly are so many other countries revisiting nuclear, making statements in support and putting in place systems to either build their first reactor or to build more to complement their existing fleets? So why nuclear? Because it's been demonstrated to work. That's the simple answer. It's the lowest carbon generating source we have. It can decarbonize an electricity system. It's the most reliable source of energy. I can show you a few images later on um, to demonstrate this. A few other reasons. Nuclear provides fantastic energy security, as I just said. It has the highest capacity factor of all the technologies and runs continuously for months or even years at a time. Um, unlike coal, you can also store years worth of nuclear fuel at the site of the nuclear plant. Um, nuclear also contributes to a strong economy, be, economy by providing a uh, stable and reliable electricity supply. Um, nuclear is also multi-use. And by that, I mean it can be, and it is used for electricity generation, heat production for industry and residential heating, and desalination. And one day it'll also play in the hydrogen production market. Um, although nuclear costs are absolutely dominated by the upfront capital cost, they have low operating costs and are very economical over the long term. 
if deep decarbonisation is your goal, like you have a net zero target that you want to reach, there's plenty of research that suggests that a combination of nuclear and renewables together will be the cheapest system to implement. Um, also, two more things. Nuclear has the lowest overall environmental footprint. I can show you some data on this if anyone's interested. Uh, but this includes very low land use, and low materials use, and a waste stream that is fully accounted for and managed to very high regulatory standards, unlike some other technologies. Uh, last but not least, nuclear offers high paying, high skilled jobs, not for life, but for generations. The kind of stable jobs where you don't have to move constantly or be forever looking for your next contract. Stable, high paying and highly skilled. Uh, nuclear is a bit like a smorgasbord. <laughs> it has something to offer everybody from climate change action to a strong economy. So at the end of the day, people and industry just want access to reliable electricity and energy at a decent price, preferably clean. Nuclear can help Australia to get there. Okay, thank you everybody. That's my sales pitch for today. But I absolutely wanna see what some of these questions are and have a look at the comments and hopefully have some interaction. So I'll pass over to Tyrone. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Joe. And sorry for not introducing you appropriately earlier. <laughs> you did a really good job. Um, all right, so we do have some questions that I have copied across from the chat, uh, but uh, Joe would really love to hear from you. So if you, I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves, but please don't all jump in at once. Uh, if you can either uh, put your name in the chat uh, or down the bottom, you can raise your hands via reactions. Um, and I will call your name and then we'll get to you. Um, all right, so uh, I will just ask one of the questions that was put forward in the chat. So this comes from Nicholas. He says, um, Energy Minister Chris Bowen has frequently claimed during question time that nuclear energy is the most expensive form of energy and cites the CSIRO as backing him up on this. How has he arrived at this conclusion? Okay, so for anyone who's not familiar with the CSI report, they put out a report every year called the Gen Cost Report. Um, not an expert on this report, but basically it does look at the, I think called the levelized cost of electricity. So what is the cost of one technology compared to another based on various assumptions? So in the Gen Cost Report, there is a, a cost for nuclear in there that prices nuclear with a significantly higher um, levelized cost of electricity compared to other technologies, other low carbon technologies. An issue with the gen cost report from my perspective is I understand that the work on the nuclear risk pricing was subcontracted from CSIRO to another party. And for me, there isn't a clear transparent explanation in the gen cost report as to how they arrived at their number. How did you get to that number for nuclear? And there's been quite a bit of debate and questioning from people who know a bit about nuclear to try to get more information on that and to try to understand why a significantly higher number has been used for the LCOE for nuclear um, compared to reports out of other countries, for example. So I think what we see at the moment is a environment minister who's putting a fair bit of confidence in a single report that is heavily disputed in its numbers. The thing is, though, what I, I personally think Australia needs to do is look forward to whether it's 2050 or, or 2100 at some point and say, if we truly want to be net zero, what systems do we need? Can we have a 100% um, solar system? with a lot of backup and a lot of transmission lines, is that is that the ultimate cheapest, most efficient and effective system? Um, and if it is, then, okay, demonstrate it. If it isn't, what combinations of technologies can be used together for the, for the cheapest, most effective, most decarbonized system that we can come up with? So there's some great studies out of the, out of the MIT over in the US that show 
pretty clearly that if you want to minimize your cost of decarbonization, a combination of renewables and nuclear together will give the overall system cost. So even if solar, for example, or wind has a lower levelized cost of electricity in the CSIRO gen cost report, um, LCOE doesn't take into account any other system costs, which can include things like transmission. So we've already got the government talking about tens of billions of dollars investment in, in transmission lines to enable these, renew these renewable technologies. That's okay to, to, to put in more transmission lines, but who's paying for it? It's the, the taxpayers of Australia who are paying for those transmission lines. It isn't included in the cost of the LCOEs for things like wind and solar. Nuclear, a lot of work in the US looking at whether they can take their existing coal sites and transition them to nuclear. Why would you do that? Because your transmission lines are already there. Your cooling intakes are there. So much of the infrastructure can be reused. So that was quite a long answer and I do apologize that. But in summary, LCOE, not the best indicator of total system costs, what everything's gonna cost you. Um, and plenty of other countries are looking at nuclear and thinking it's economical. And I'm not quite convinced yet that Australia is somehow different to other countries, but I'm open to being convinced. So please convince me. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we've got a couple of people with their hands up. I'll ask uh, Michael uh, Mountaney if he would like to speak. Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm going to copy a, a link into the um, into the chat. I don't know if you're going to follow it quickly, but I'll, I'll try um, to copy this one in. My question is, and it's kind of devil's advocate in a sense, if nuclear energy is so uh, straightforward and without any complications. Why do we have facilities such as the Swedish waste disposal facility uh, that's described in, our, in that link that I've just copied into the chat there? It does seem that disposal of waste is a big issue. Now, I know that Australia is in quite a good position there and that we have large tracts of pretty much unused and unusable territory where we could bury this stuff. Um, but you can't, you can't just keep burying it indefinitely, can you? Is there a, a way of reusing it or reducing it? Or are, are these huge, elaborate disposal systems just actually unnecessary? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I did a whole TEDx talk on nuclear waste. So... <laughs> I'll get Tyrone, if you don't mind, Tyrone, if you've got a second to pop a link into the chat for anyone who's interested. Uh, so you're right, Sweden is probably the second country in the world in terms of their, their progress towards setting up what's known as a deep underground geological disposal facility or repository. Finland's actually a little bit further ahead and they're expected to start putting their used nuclear fuel um, underground as early as 2025. So the reality is that scientists and engineers have known for decades what to do with nuclear waste. And when I say nuclear waste, I'm referring specifically to use nuclear fuel because that's what most people are concerned about when they say, what about the waste? So scientists and engineers have known the two routes that you can take uh, with this waste. I think Sweden is going down the route of sticking it underground which is one option. Um, it's what other countries, including Germany, for instance, currently do with other toxic and hazardous waste. They, they put them underground because uh, you can put things underground in, in geologically stable areas and it's not going to go anywhere for the amount of time that it takes for it to become no longer a hazard. The other option, if you don't want to bury it, is to do a recycle on it. You can actually, if you do a full recycle of nuclear waste, you can reduce how long that waste stays hazardous for, from you know, potentially tens of thousands of years, so sort of less than 500 years. But in this case, you still need probably to put it underground for five years, because that is the best place. It's the lowest, the, the place with the, the very, very lowest likelihood that's ever gonna con in, come in contact with people or the environment and, and do harm. So either way, whether you take your used fuel and put it straight underground, like uh, Finland and Sweden are planning on doing, or whether you recycle it out of that, everything that you possibly can, 
you probably still need to put it underground for a period of time. But the, the, the period of time is no longer, you know, tens of thousands of years. It is literally hundreds of years. It's the difference between the two things. So technically, know how to do it. It's always a political game, though. The reason that Finland and Sweden have been able to actually pick sites is they had good community support. The people understand, they've put their hands up, they've volunteered sites, um, and they've been successful. Great, thank you so much, Joe. We will get to the questions that have been put in the chat. I'm just mindful that we have people with their hands up. Uh, we don't have a name, it is just iPhone. So iPhone, please ask your question. Um, hi, hi, iPhone, how are you going? Sorry, it's Jonathan. Can you hi, hear Jonathan. me? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, uh, no, thanks for the talk, Joe, and, and thanks for your um, earlier uh, TED Talks, which I've listened to, and they're, they're very good. Okay. Um, I, 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 just, I originally put my head up sort of to ask the economic question. Uh, just a quick further thought on that. I reckon just in light of the current debate that's starting to happen in Australia, which is good to see, I reckon the easiest response we should make at this stage is just um, make it legal and let's see if you can get the cost economic. You know, let's, let's just, you know, why not just make it legal? And, um, you know, and, and I think that's a good response at this stage to the elbows and so forth who say, oh, it's too expensive or it can't work. It's just like, well, let's just see if the industry can make it work. And I think there will be yeah, a, a sort of, um, I think there needs to be a, a bit of a process there because countries like Australia and other countries in the West haven't done nuclear for a while. So there's going to be a learning curve, I think. But, um, but yeah, that, that's be. a thought. Um, it's absolutely, it's absolutely right, Michael. So you're absolutely right. Um, as I keep saying to lots of people, removing a ban on nuclear energy is not an automatically an automatic green light to building nuclear power stations. Yeah, it's just yeah. an indication that Australia is now open for business. Um, I've got friends who work for SMR vendors overseas who don't even really consider Australia because why are they even going to sort of waste their resources trying to come and talk to us about um, about their technology and what it could do for our country when they have customers in other countries putting their hands up to order these things. Yeah. And just a quick question. Um, any thoughts on uh, how we can, I suppose, start to persuade the progressive side of politics? Because I suppose this, uh, this Zoomcast is maybe starting that journey. But um, yeah, that's, as I see it, the main barrier. I mean, we've seen Dutton sort of wanting to start a conversation and it seems conservatives for various reasons have sort of been on the nuclear you know, pro pro camp for a while, but um, progressives, there's a big roadblock there. And um, I mean, it's maybe some cracks are starting to open and with the South Australian Premier um, coming out a couple of days ago saying he wants a conversation, so that's really positive. But yeah, just any thoughts on how we can start, you know, um, and, and if you see any, any hope or any um, positive signs in that direction. I guess in my talk, I mentioned a little bit that the Democrats in the US, they changed their position after mm. being not, not necessarily full on anti-nuclear, but not supporting really any new builds for sort of decades, um, to now saying, hang on, we, are, we know that we need this now. What can we do that to help the nuclear industry? And they're actually investing quite a lot in things like small modular reactors and also um, having to subsidise the operating nuclear plants because of really low gas prices over there, trying to save mm. some of those plants. So changing a position of nuclear parties does happen on this topic. Uh, I think something that might, for instance, um, interest the Labor Party is because the jobs are stable and they're high paying and they're highly skilled, nuclear lends itself very nicely to a nice unionised workforce. Mm. It, it absolutely does. Um, some studies out of the US looking at if you change from a coal plant to a nuclear plant, what will that do for, for jobs? It actually increases the number of jobs because you do need more workers in a nuclear plant than you do in a coal plant. You've got a just transition here from people who can work in coal, who can go and work in nuclear. There will be some upskilling, but a lot of the jobs are very, very similar. So I think I'm not sure why the whole unionised workforce side of, a, of nuclear doesn't appeal to labour. Maybe it does. Um, that's the only two things I've got, but I'm asking no. the audience. It's no, not that, just that's... about my opinions. I'd like to hear yours too, Michael. What do you think? Uh, I'm Jonathan, by the way, but yeah. Oh, Jonathan, um... sorry. <laughs> No, no. I mean, I, I think they're, they're two things that come to mind as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I don't have any formulated thoughts on it really other than what you've just said. And um, yeah, I, I do see it as a big roadblock though, because I can't see it making much, I can't see the legal question becoming 
or any political part really pol political party really taking it until it's sort of more or less bipartisan so i feel like that's a crucial thing is to try and start uh making some inroads on on the progressive side of politics but anyway um we'll see see what happens but uh, yeah i think i think the kind of arguments you just made are, are the kind of ones you'd have to make as somebody who in their life will generally align with the more progressive side of politics on many issues it's it's a it's a tough one because i can see all these benefits and i can definitely see the downsides of nuclear as well but i also see the opportunity and and i see well, what is the goal i mean climate change i'm burning things coal gas um dung timber is killing eight million people every single year mm. And even if you look at some of the worst, worst estimates from the effects of nuclear accidents, they're nowhere near <laughs> that, right? No, like, like they're orders of magnitude lower than the, the, the damage that burning things is doing um, to the world's population in terms of air pollution. Uh, I'm at a bit of a loss. And please, if anyone has any ideas. Um, yeah. yeah, no, no. I think you've answered it really well from, from my perspective. So, yeah, you feel free to ask somebody else. But, uh, yeah, no. I, yeah, Thank you, Jonathan, not Michael. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Jonathan, and thanks, Joe. Uh, okay, the next person with their hand up is Saha. Uh, Hello. Thank Hello. you so much again, Joe, for coming. Um, we want to have more of these kinds of sessions anyway, and nuclear has been a contentious topic. We've had people um, who are faithfully against nuclear. I myself, I'm a bit agnostic. I mean, um, I come from the science perspective but I have my own reservations about um, waste management. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone is scared of radiation and cancer and all of that. Um, and I think possibly education campaigns on those things need to happen. And I'd be curious how um, Sweden and Finland address that. Maybe they had some pretty robust education on that mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's where it stops. And I think fear is a really good motivator for people to not um, approach anything further and see the positives as, as not being um, relevant. Um, so I guess my question is, and I notice it's not really a technical one, um, it's more a political one, but if you don't want to answer that, I'll ask a technical one that I just saw in the chat. Um, <laughs> I noticed just around my neighbourhood in Sydney 10, 15 years ago, there were um, posters everywhere saying, we are a nuclear-free zone. And I remember seeing that and thinking, yeah, good because I feel safe um I'm just wondering if you have an opinion on um where that came about and I guess what you think would be a good idea to um reverse that um and my, my other question was to your suggestion about jobs um upskilling people um how long would that take if we were to upskill coal miners and workers no problems. Let's start with the um, nuclear free zones first, because I, I say I have a chuckle, but every time I go to Newtown, there's a new, uh, nuclear free zone sign in Newtown, but there's also a hospital. I think it's Royal Prince Alfred, isn't it? That's very close by that does nuclear medicine and has a cyclotron, which are nuclear techniques, right? So the nuclear free zones were set up, um, I believe, in the 70s and 80s, and they were mainly set up... Um, to show that nuclear weapons weren't welcome in the area. So they definitely started off more with a nuclear weapons and a non-proliferation theme. Um, I don't think they have any legal basis whatsoever, but it's more the local councils and the people don't want nuclear weapons in this area. Uh, but some councils have gone further and said, we don't want nuclear weapons or nuclear energy um, in, in their policies, which again, don't have legal backing, uh, but it's more just, a a statement of this is this is what this is how we feel about these things. Um, some will also say um, we don't like some nuclear stuff, but we do like nuclear medicine. That's OK. So there's a whole, a whole different range. I don't know how many councils have these uh, particular policies, but I did try to look it up once and couldn't easily find which ones do and don't. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. It was about nuclear weapons and I don't really want to have nuclear weapons in my local government area either. No, thank yeah, you. Yeah, wow, um, interesting. Okay, but thank I, you. But I personally would be happy to live near uh, a nuclear power reactor. Maybe because I, I know a fair bit about it and I'm comfortable with the risks and the benefits because I'm exposed to it. Um, the other question was about upskilling. Yeah. So, so from um, coal workers to, yeah. Okay, so 
a lot of people who work in coal plants, I'm assuming come from a, uh, a, a trades background. So if you look at the Opal research reactor, the dominant workforce at Opal is people from trades backgrounds, the people doing the maintenance, the reactor operators from trades backgrounds, or the people doing the stuff in the reactor are, are trades backgrounds. And the next biggest sort of a group of employees would be the engineers. So at a, nu a nuclear power plant, it'd be very similar. There'd be a lot of people with trades backgrounds who would need to keep the plant running. They would, and possibly even operate um, the nuclear reactors and there'd be engineers doing their engineering type things and scientists and emergency response personnel and medical personnel and comms people and whatever else a site like this would need, like sort of outside of the direct running of the reactor. So a, a turbine technician, if such a thing exists um, in a coal plant could do the same job in a nuclear plant. It's the same, same technology we're talking about. So how long would it take to upskill? Um, there's certain things you'd have to do around safe, the thing called safety culture. You're expected to act a certain way when you're in a nuclear plant. You don't walk past a hazard, you do something about it. Mm. I'm not saying that does happen in a coal plant, but um, that's a certain behavior that you'd want to train people in. Um, yeah, so how long would that take? I, I don't know. Some of it could be on the job, I, I would imagine. Um, for reactor operators, we do have nuclear engineering and nuclear science masters in Australia already. So we could train people, you know, through the academic side at the moment and then train them on the plan as well. It takes about six months in Australia, I think, for a reactor operator to become accredited through all the job. But that's, that's the classroom and then more time on the job as well. So mm -hmm. in the order of years, I would say, to, to get fully up to speed. That sounds all right. Um, it's not too bad, yeah. We've also got, sorry, this program called the AUKUS agreement. Whether you agree with nuclear powered submarines or not, it's going to bring an upskilling of engineers and scientists in this country who can then go and work in nuclear power plants should we have them in the future. Mm -hmm. Cool. And just from what you were saying before about uh, gen cost, so that tends to be the argument. I, I just remember... Um, uh, a Labor and Greens candidate outright just said about nuclear, it's expensive and dropped it. And that was it. <laughs> and uh... Uh, we lost Saha oh. for a second. Uh -huh. Okay. Again, is something being expensive a reason to ban it? Because electric cars are still fairly expensive. Shall we ban them? Of course we shouldn't. Because if you make something available and an option, the prices will come down. Yes. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so we have one more person with their hand up. Uh, Bryn. Yep. Hi. Hello. As mentioned earlier, I mentioned before I can see. I was replying, Angus, but when I put a quote in the chat saying nuclear. When it's great, it's great. But when it fails, it fails big. And I think most people, when they refer to that, they're going to think of, let's think, well, the big one would be Chernobyl, but the more recent one in in their heads would be Fukushima, would be Fukushima, there's Three Mile and the like. Not that other big explosions and I screw things up and there's all sorts of issues. I know Chernobyl, were, didn't they get effed up because, mostly because the Soviets were weakening protections because they wanted to boost the byproducts? And by byproducts, I of course mean missile fuel for missiles. And well, for Fukushima, a little bit old, and it just got hit with an earthquake and a tsunami. <laughs> it's maybe they didn't plan as well as they could have, but yeah. So I think a lot of people were trying to say is what plans, what mitigations would be needed to make sure that we don't get those big fails. Okay, there were big fails in terms of they got a lot of media attention. <laughs> Absolutely. How would you like to classify big? Are we talking death rates here? Are we talking like, like as big as it is subjective? I just want to make sure I can answer your question um, as best as possible. So I can show you some stats on the impacts of those two accidents in terms of death rates. Is that something you're interested in? 
or in, or are you more interested in other things? So I'll let you talk. I think probably what I was saying is I understand that they, in the big scheme, they weren't big, horrid, whatever. It's just I'm thinking scary, and especially because the fact is, let's talk Chernobyl because that is of a much greater, yes, Fukushima and Chernobyl of the same classification, which is the worst, but the fact is Chernobyl is many, many factors worse, worse, relatively speaking, than Fukushima. And we know things that could go even worse if necessary. So I think I would say newsworthy, which I mean, it's impossible. So just thinking. I mean, I maybe, think cool. oh, sorry. Yeah. So maybe accidents that would deny the use of land for longer than... I think 20 or probably even 10 years. 10 years, okay. I think, which is, I think that sounds about your average for, but then again, even that's probably not to that because I'm certain Fukushima, I know, doesn't have a major exclusion zone anymore. I know I, Chernobyl does. Yep, I, I understand about 90% of the Fukushima population has returned or doesn't wish to but I got that off Twitter. So it may or may not be accurate. And Chernobyl does have an exclusion zone. And in that exclusion zone, the animals are thriving because there are no people there. So I would argue that humans are worse for <laughs> populations and the environment than, than, than radiation is. If we look at the, the Chernobyl accident, um, it was a design that would not have got licensed in the West because it had a it had a design flaw that apparently the Soviet regime knew about but didn't tell their operators. The reactors also didn't have a containment, which you know Western reactors do to to contain um, a lot of the radiation. Um, it's interesting about Chernobyl because the accident was in 1986. There was four reactors on that site. They all shut. One was destroyed. The other three shut down, and then started up again. And the last one didn't shut down for good until the year 2000. So for effectively 14 years after the Chernobyl reactor accident, so one of the units kept on operating. There was people, and there still are people there working there every single day. Okay. So as I said, and I agree with that. It's just I'm thinking more how most people, when they think of nuclear okay. power, they're going to think of, as I mentioned, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, Free Mile Island and a whole bunch of, and there's probably even others that I've forgotten that are big ones. Have you heard of the um, the Banchow fa Dam failure at all? Oh, I think I can get that. That Banchow? probably killed a lot more people than, than Chernobyl ever did. It did. So there was a big dam failure in China. I can't remember when, what the year was, and it tragically killed oh, 100,000 plus people. There's different estimates, but no one, not many people have heard of it. Whereas you look at something like a Chernobyl or Fukushima because it made news and stayed in the news for months and months and months and months. Um, it was scary for people. People like to hear about it and news media has kept playing it over and over again. Um, some accidents receive more attention than others. That's all I'm saying. Was it warranted for the nuclear accidents? Um, that's for you to decide. I'm not going say, to say yes or no. Yeah, Just remember I... though, in Fukushima, about 20,000 people tragically died in the earthquake and the tsunami. And to date, no one has died from radiation exposure. So it was a huge natural event that happened that, that devastated so many people's lives. And add on top of that, having to evacuate people, it's an extra stress and it's an extra horrible thing. Like lots of horrible things happened there. It wasn't just a nuclear meltdown. And I agree with you with the whole thing. I'm mm -hmm. one of the people that can see I was just thinking more because I knew that was the common people Thanks. objecting. All right. Thank, thanks, Bryn. Uh, Sorry for being mindful. On. No, no, you're okay. It, we, we need these kind of questions because it, it's a poor part of the discussion. So I appreciate you uh, raising that. Um, so we're just moving on because we are approaching an hour. Uh, so we have some questions from chat. So a couple of people have asked, uh, what is the viability and, and current 
uh, commercialization stage for small modular reactors? Excellent question. So there's already small modular reactors operating on a lot of nuclear powered subs around the world that they're effectively small modular reactors. But in terms of you know, land-based reactors, oh, sorry, there's also a few on uh, Russian icebreakers as well. So civilian use. In terms of more, okay. It's a difficult question and I'll tell you why. Because there's about 70 or 80 different designs under development. So I can pick particular countries. We'll start with um, Canada is investing quite heavily in small modular reactors. One of the reasons why is that they've got remote populations who they have to deliver, deliver diesel fuel to. And if they don't, people will literally freeze to death, right? So they're very interested in SMRs um, in remote communities. They broke ground, or not broke ground, they started preparing um, a site in Ontario for their first SMR just in the last week. They've got a site, they've got a design that they picked. Um, they have to get regulatory approvals to, to start construction, but they're super keen. And they've got a deadline for the first one operating by 2028. In the US, um, they're looking at how they can change coal to nuclear. There is one particular uh, place in Wyoming. They have a site, they have a reactor. Um, the US Department of Energy is investing $2 billion in a first of a kind. And um, the company is owned by Bill Gates. So maybe some of his friends will chip in the other $2 billion. Um, that also is expected also the aim, and this is a US government aim, is 2028 as well. Who else is doing things? Uh, New Scout, another company, there's all these other companies that have um, customers and clients looking at 2028 to 2031 to have their first ones out. But the first reactor, the first of anything is always the hardest, right? And once you've got the first, you've got your supply chain set up, then you build your second and it gets cheaper and your third and your fourth. Um, some of these vendors in the US uh, and Canada and the UK are actually, um, sorry, US and Canada in particular, are actually uh, starting to basically take orders for the future. Like people are, countries are like, we want these things. This is how many, how many we're gonna wanna, probably how many we're gonna order. This is kind of when we want them. So it, it is happening. But what I want to see is actual construction and actual operation. I don't know about you guys, but I, we can talk about SMRs um, as much as we want, but unless the vendors and the companies are being successful in building them, it's not going to happen here, right? So from an Australian perspective, if someone was to ask me when, I would say sometime in the 2030s. In the meantime, we need to see what we can do with renewables and other technologies, right? Do what we can and then bring on the new technology uh, when it is ready to go. That being said, there's plenty of other reactor designs that are approved and licensed in other countries that we could build, like the big, the big reactors, right? They're proven designs. We, we could go down the big reactor route as well. It doesn't have to be um, SMRs. Great, thanks, Joe. Uh, the comparison that I often hear is, Apple spends about $1.5 billion developing each generation of new iPhone. So the very first new iPhone costs $1.5 billion for them to make. The very next one costs $500. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the first of a kind is always more expensive, uh, but the, the better we, the more we build, the, the cheaper it becomes. Um, all right, so we have some other questions here. Adam says, we're finding that solar is providing issues with energy infrastructure and capacity to the point where South Australia had to turn off consumer panels last year to normalise energy production. Are there changes to existing infrastructure that would need to be considered to accommodate nuclear reactors? Uh, was that Adam? Sorry, Adam's question. Thank you, Adam. Yes, Adam. Thank you, Adam, for that. Um, the good thing about nuclear is it's synchronous, like gas and coal are. So what it does, it will offer advantages in terms of grid strength and grid reliability. And um, I've got to get my, my terms right. I'm learning about this stuff at the moment. Frequency control and voltage control, system strength. It's like coal and gas in that respect. So you can do a straight coal to nuclear transition and it provides the kind of system inertia and strength that will actually allow more wind and solar onto the system. Just this week, um, AEMO down in South Australia, I think it was this week, could have been last week, um, was they put out warnings every now and again and they sometimes will turn off things like wind and solar, they'll curtail, curtail them. 
And just recently, they had to order gas to come online because they didn't have enough synchronous generation. So there wasn't a problem with the renewables not generating enough. They didn't have enough stability uh, within the system. They had to order gas to come on. Would you rather have gas coming on or nuclear coming on? Like I, I know the answer to that one myself purely from the, the climate change perspective. Um, so nuclear does offer the ability to help control frequency um, and voltage and things like that. The things that renewables need. You can buy things called um, synchronous condensers, I think they're called, if anyone on here knows all about the tech, but that's an extra cost that you're adding to the cost of your wind and solar alongside the transmission and the um, storage and everything else that you need uh, to make that kind of system work. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, the, also the, the big battery that was highly publicized a couple of years ago, one of its primary jobs is frequency control. That's correct. Um, because it, it can, you know, respond within milliseconds. <laughs> so it's that, uh, but those ancillary services are quite expensive and that's where the, these uh, companies are making a lot of money off that and that's contributing to some of the higher prices in South Australia. Um, we have a question from Angus. How does nuclear compare between land use? Uh, sorry, so what's the land use between nuclear and other forms of power generation? That is a wonderful question. And that's the one thing I don't have an image on that I can pull up and say, here you go. Look, with things like solar, it depends because you can use existing structures, right? You can use existing buildings to put your solar panels on. Uh, the kinds of numbers of solar panels we're going to need, though, if Australia is going to pursue some kind of 100% renewable future, uh, is big enough that we're going to have solar farms as well. Cheers, Tyrone. Do you have the numbers off the top of your head? about how many times more land you need? I just linked it in the chat. So oh, thank you. Uh, according to our world and data, nuclear uses uh, 0.3 uh, square metres per megawatt hour. Uh, rooftop solar uses 1.2 uh, square metres per megawatt hour. Uh, grid scale solar PV is rough, is the average median is 12.6 square metres per megawatt hour. Um, and Onshore wind is 0.4, so it's the closest to nuclear. Um, sorry, yeah, that's onshore wind. Um, that's the direct impact of the turbine itself. But if you include the whole project site, that goes to uh, greater than uh, 99 square metres uh, per megawatt hour. So, yeah, it, it nuclear is the lowest um, in, of all energy for sources. So for land nuclear use. is four times lower than rooftop solar? Which is how many uh, times? Forty yes, times yes. lower than forty yeah. times lower than um, solar farms and that kind of thing. Yes. And geez, oh, three hundred times lower than wind. If you look at the whole area and not just the area of the of the turbine spinning, it doesn't right. use much. It's 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 um, some of the SMRs um, talk about their site being how big is it? A kilometer across, I think. So it fits well within a gas or a coal existing site, I would imagine. Don't quote me on that one. All right. Uh, we have a Andrea's uh, uh, yeah, raised I just her hand. <laughs> yeah, just in response to that, I'm I'm just curious. I might go and check how they calculate that um, the the footprint of rooftop solar, which you would think would be zero. I'm very curious as to how they calculate that. Um, and for wind turbines, yeah, that it depends. I mean, I've been to a wind turbine uh, in Scotland where you're encouraged to walk around. I mean, Scotland's got a, a culture of um, the, the common land being free for everyone to walk around in. Uh, and they've kept that up with wind turbines to demystify them. Um, but it is it is convenient, obviously, that nuclear power stations can fit in the, the footprint of um, coal power plants and gas power plants as we decommission them. I find that very neat. Yeah, sorry, I should say that the, the data from our world and data is a life cycle assessment. So it's including all the resource oh, extraction and manufacturing things like that as well. Oh, that makes sense. 
Uh, let me just have a look what other questions we have. There's a question here about, I think land use is not the problem for Australia. Um, yes and no. Yes, we have a lot of land, but whose land is it that we're using and exploiting farmers, um, indigenous populations? Because all these things aren't going to go near cities. They're going to go a bit further away. Um, yes, we have a lot of land, but how how can we best use that land? Is the best land, uh, best use agriculture? Is it rewilding? Should we be trying to plant more trees? Is it energy production? I don't know the answer. It depends where it is. But at the end of the day, it's the people living in remote and rural communities that are going to have these things in their communities. Um, should they be bearing the brunt of this and all the transmission lines um, just so the cities can have energy? Again, it's just something I think about from time to time. I definitely don't have or haven't have my own thoughts, but I don't have the, the answer or anything like that. Mm. If uh, I could just Andrea, jump in yeah. Yeah. We'll um, go to Saha. Yeah, it was just, that just made me think of Iceland, which gets at least two thirds of its power from hydro, um, uh, you know, dammed rivers, um, not pumped hydro, I don't think, but um, those were, there might be some, sorry, forget I said that. Um, the building of those dams was their big environmental protest moments because of all the, the land that it floods. Um, so you would say Iceland's, Iceland's got a small population and their electricity generation is basically all renewable coming from uh, geothermal, whatever's not produced by hydropower, but it's it's not without controversy and damage. I think, like I said before, every every technology has a, the pros and cons. So like, how can we use them all together for the overall outcome that we want in terms of reliable energy and, and low carbon emissions, but also don't do other damage in other areas? or as little, as little damage as possible. We're humans, we damage things, right? That's what we do. Definitely. All right, uh, Saha, if you would like to unmute yourself, please. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I got cut off, unfortunately. Um, it was just, yeah, my, my phone. Um, so I guess I just wanted to um, summarize what you were saying before about gen cost. So what I got from that was, um, people are saying that it's expensive to set up the infrastructure to have nuclear power, but they're not taking into account the, the positive outcomes from that. So the marginal benefit um, versus coal, which I think could be comparatively cheap to continue using because we already have all the infrastructure, um, but is creating huge cost to the environment. So they're not factoring that in when they're talking about cost. So I think that's the limitation there. Is that what you were meaning it's, as well? It's another limitation. Um, that that's why it doesn't take into account external. What's that word? External. Oh yeah. E externalities. That's it. Externalities. Okay. Yeah. I can't say that tonight. Um, yeah, LCOE. My understanding is it was set up as a an easy way to directly compare, say, one kind of gas plant to another kind of gas plant. So very similar technology, you can, you can compare them to see which one's going to be cheaper to build and operate in the long term, right? For something like solar, which I think is great in many you know, applications, it has a very a relatively low capacity factor. It produces 25% of the time. Great. You know it's not going to produce at night time, so there is some predictability there, but clouds go over a solar farm, down it goes, something else has to come up to replace it really, really quickly. So mm. solar... Cheap to build, absolutely operates twenty five percent of the time. What are you doing the other seventy five percent of the time? Yeah, nuclear more expensive to build at the beginning, absolutely true. But its capacity factor, the world average is about I think eighty three percent. US runs theirs at ninety three percent. So you know what's going to be operating when you need it. Solar and wind may be there when you need it, may not be there when you need it. And if you don't have those, what's your other low carbon technology um, that you're using? at those times so hydro is an option yep um some kind of batteries but the batteries we have now the big batteries are as um tyrone said they're not there to back up the grid they're there to provide stability things like frequency mm. and voltage right they're not there as a backup system um also lcoe does include some storage i think five, i think it's solar with five hours of battery backup or something like that but what does that mean mm. yeah yeah, they're complicated reports from my perspective. It's a hard thing to understand. Um, but the good thing is you can use, like some people think that nuclear and renewables are against each other. 
I don't see that. I see them as being very supportive of each other. Nuclear mm. could be dispatchable and there when you need it. Uh, and solar and wind can come and charge uh, batteries and, and make hydrogen and, and do whatever, right? They can work together. It doesn't have to be a big fight between the two. Yeah, I think the main um, the main hindrance is the fear factor. And it's really unfortunate um, that nuclear war is being talked about. And so, yeah, people just go nuclear, no thanks. We'll have to work on that. I will show you one. I was gonna pull this one up before. This is from our world in data again, if I can work out how to make it big. Is that displaying okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't really like talking about death rates. And this is one part of energy considerations because one of the other tragedies of Chernobyl and Fukushima, as we said before, was people getting displaced and having their lives turned upside down. But if you look at the actual impacts of accidents and these various technologies against each other in terms of how many people die as a result, and this does include Fukushima and Chernobyl in this, in this data. As I say to people, nuclear is as safe as wind and solar. In terms of just the, the, the number of fatalities um, being caused by the whole, all, all aspects of, of these technologies. Look at coal, I mean, <laughs> another tragedy of Chernobyl, from my perspective, Chernobyl in particular, is that it really turned the Western countries off continuing to build more nuclear. So I don't know, I've seen an estimate of how many um, lives have been saved by nuclear energy through reducing um, air pollution. It's something in the order of several million. So just say Chernobyl hadn't happened um, and the Western world and everyone kept building nuclear reactors, what would, where would that put us now in terms of climate change? Where would it put us now in terms of air pollution? Like these things, they'd be a much lesser problems than they are today. Anyway, there's some data, our building data. They've got a great, um, like an article on how they get to these numbers too. Don't just take my word for it that nuclear is as safe as, uh, as renewables. Go and have a look yourself just to see how they, they came to these numbers. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. I, we'll probably go for about another five minutes and then we'll have to wrap up as uh, we've been going for a little while now. Um, we do have one more question from chat, uh, which was, uh, ignoring the the political issues and the planning processes from starting a construction to finish to turning the reactor on how long would it take to build roughly from starting the construction to turning yep. the reactor on yeah it depends what you're building and that might sound like a cop out if you're building one of the bigger units you probably how long is a piece of string? Some countries are really good at building these things. At the moment, South Korea has just built a whole lot of new reactors in the United Arab Emirates. They built four reactors, three are online. The fourth one's, I think, undergoing commissioning. They started in 2009. 2009, to the first one, I think, online 20, well, I can't remember, but they almost got their fourth one online. So what is that, 13 years? That's for five point two gigawatts I think quite a bit small modular reactors the whole I, reason why they're they're popular and they're getting promoted and they're getting developed and worked on is the idea that big reactors are taking a long time to build more than half the price for a lot of big reactor projects isn't is, is interest on the loans right that's it's a lot of interest that these construction people and then the vendors are paying idea about small modular reactors is you don't build a reactor on the site, you build a reactor in a factory. It's small. You make the same thing over and over and over again to high levels of quality. If you do this, you should be able to build them a lot more cheaply in a factory, right, than on somebody's site. And then you ship them off and then you just join all the components together. So how long? Oh. Different um, vendors are quoting different numbers, and I'll pull one out of the air and say they're looking at about maybe three years of a construction time. Does that sound about right, Tyrone? You know a fair bit about this stuff too. Uh, yeah, it uh, globally the average is about six to eight years for a large reactor, and the uh, SMRs right. are they're hoping for around three to five years, depending on the. Uh, SMR is a very broad term. You've got something as small as you know a couple of uh, like 
couple of dozen uh, megawatts to something like the BWRX, which is like 300 megawatts. So that it's, a, it's a big range. So that, that's where the variability comes from. Uh, it's yeah. also important to put this in context that something like the Star of the South, which is the big offshore wind um, farm that they're building off Victoria, that's expected to take about 10 years to construct for roughly the same amount of megawatts as a large nuclear reactor. So oh. it's similar timescales. For a similar price as well. For a similar price as well, yes. So it is yeah. important to put these in context um, that this is this is a big job to, to transition the energy system, uh, which is not just the current electricity as well, it's transport, it's uh, mm -hmm. the chemicals industry, it's, it's all those um, sectors that need to be electrified and, and transitioned across. So this is a big challenge and we really thank you joe for coming along and uh helping us this evening understand more about nuclear uh and as you said in your talk uh, uh, at the start it's it's more than just energy as well it's it's medicine and it's it's industrial processes and things like that um uh sorry saha has one more question and then we will end <laughs> uh hang on i will just there you go saha i've given you the ability oh to thanks ask. Oh, no, it, we just received a very um, detailed email recently um, from some of our members uh, that have concerns about nuclear. And I think, you know, we really want to help educate everyone, including myself, just to be more informed about, you know, where we position with nuclear. So um, if you don't mind, are you happy if we can share an email with you um, outside of this to get your take on it? I think that would be really useful. Um, absolutely. I would um, love to read the email and have a look. Um, what I really do enjoy, though, is, is, is talking to people and trying to understand their concerns, and trying mm. to come to a bit more of a mutual understanding. So I'll, I'll definitely take a look and I, I might come back and say I would love to have a chat. Yeah, that's a coffee, good idea. Coffee, beer, online, if we're not in the same state as each other. Um, <laughs> whatever works, because if People have concerns about anything. I mean, people don't have to engage me with, with me or anybody else if, if they don't choose to. I'm not going to put that sort of pressure on, but the offer is there. Because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've missed something. I sometimes check myself and say, I think this technology, it has its flaws and its faults, but at the same time, I think it's the best we've got at the moment yeah. to decarbonize actually get to net zero and also offer reliable um, electricity at probably the lowest price in conjunctions with, with renewables as well. Am I missing something? Maybe I am. So yeah, maybe yeah. I can be convinced that I should be <laughs> talking about a 100% renewable future or, or some, other, some other future. Yeah, I like that. It's a good approach. Um, we are thinking we, we should have more of a chat. Um, so I'll, I'll get your take on it. And then, yeah, we should have more inter-member chats about these contentious topics. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If the Greens party in the Finland can go from walking out of parliament in about 2000, because Finland decided to build more nuclear power plants, to now doing a full 180 and being the first Greens party in the world to support uh, nuclear energy, there's no reason why other Greens parties couldn't do similar or other, uh, other political parties. Um, I think the Scandinavians are very practical people. Um, they can manage to get communities to bid to host a nuclear waste disposal facility. That, that, that's pretty good, right? They have the, the education programs and the, the communication going on that, that brings people comfort and then says, yeah, we'll have that high level waste disposal facility. Yeah, we'll have it, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure Australia is there yet, but I'm doing my best and other people are doing their best just to have these conversations. So thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and for, and for coming on and, and listening. Um, if you do have any other follow-up questions, um, please send them through and, and I'll do my best to answer them. Great, thank you so much, Joe, And thank you everyone for coming along to this evening and asking your questions. Uh, this is the kind of discussion that we want to be having so that we can progress policy development and just general community understanding of the different technologies and policy areas uh, that hopefully can make our uh, country and world a better place. So uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>